key topics. So what's been going on in Latin America while we've been talking about Europe and India? Well, in Mexico, in 1910, you see a very divided society with the rich versus the poor, the Spanish versus the Indian. And this is going to get very confusing because now when we're talking Indian, I mean Native American, indigenous peoples in the Americas. So the wealthiest people in Mexico were those of Spanish origins. They made up about 1% of Mexico's population, and yet they owned about 85% of Mexico's land. We see that American and British companies will control most of Mexico's railroads, silver mines, plantations, and industry. The indigenous peoples, many did not speak um, Spanish at all and were extremely poor. And then you still have your mestizos, the mixed race people, who will continue to work on haciendas. So, if you remember, we saw that um, after the... 1821 revolution, many wealthy Mexicans and Americans will use bribery and force to buy up the agricultural land, cutting off many poor peasants from fields, firewood, and pastures. So these wealthy peoples will force the poor to work on haciendas and buy all of these resources from the wealthy land owners, putting them into more debt. So President Proforio Diaz will encourage economic growth among the wealthy, but did not really do anything to benefit the peasants. Mexico is not self-sufficient. They are relying too much on foreign investment and exports, especially with Britain. He will use this wealth that is coming in from the foreign money to really build up Mexico City. And he will be very discriminatory against non-white Mexicans, trying to eradicate all of Mexico's indigenous roots and traditions, whether it's food, culture, or clothing. And it's not going to last. So we are going to see in 1910 the Mexican Revolution. It is going to be a rebellion that will initially occur over election reform. But it's not just election reform. You have Issues of land reform, financial reform, political, educational, all these things are at play here. So Francisco Madero, who is wealthy, white, upper class, will take power after Diaz flees. The peasants dislike him. So Madero is going to be overthrown by General Victoriano Huerta and murdered. So the dude in the seat, sorry, in the suit is going to be Madero. The guy in clearly military uniform is going to be General Huerta. President Woodrow Wilson is displeased by all of this and sends in the Marines to occupy the Mexican city of Veracruz. The inequality in Mexican society and foreign invest intervention will really frustrate middle class and industrial workers. So we see that the leaders, um, leaders will start to push back. So you have a group called the Constitutionalists, um, led by a landowner and a teacher, and they will take power in 1914, overthrowing General Huerta. But they're not working by themselves, right? There's other people pushing back as well. So you have Emiliano Zapata, and we're going to have Pancho Villa. So Zapata is indigenous in his roots. He's a revolutionary and leader of peasants in the Mexican Revolution. Soldiers were, his soldiers were really just peasants on horseback with pistols. And 
he will periodically come down from the mountains where he lived, burn some haciendas, and return the land to the indigenous villages. So he will be able to mobilize landless peasants in south-central Mexico in an attempt to seize and divide the lands of wealthy landowners. So he wanted to redistribute the land. Although he's going to be successful for a time, he will ultimately be defeated and assassinated. The third person at play here is Francisco Pancho Villa. He is going to be a populist leader during the Mexican Revolution, an outlaw in his youth. He is a former ranch hand, mule driver, bandit. He will form a cavalry in Chihuahua in northern Mexico once the revolution gets started. And he will have about 3,000 men at his disposal. He will fight for the rights of the landless, just like Zapata, and he will divide large haciendas into family ranches. He will be assassinated in 1923. So what we see here is that Mexico's in chaos, right? You have um, the constitutionalists overthrowing the government. You have... um, the American military occupying Veracruz. You have, um, oops, sorry, guys, territory controlled by Pancho Villa, territories controlled by the constitutionalists. So you have all these different groups of people vying for power. So let's see about the impact of these two men. We will see that both Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata are going to be incredibly popular and have lots of support. They will essentially function as cadillos in their own territories. Pancho Villa is going to be really in the north, in Sonora, and Chihuahua, and Zapata is really going to control territory in the south. They are both aiming to take land away from the wealthy and redistribute it to the poor. Now, they will both fight over the nature of the new regime, right? These men are not political scientists. They have no training. So they don't really have a cohesive vision for a Mexican government. They will each enjoy a lot of support, but they will never be able to rise above their own regional and peasant origins to lead a national revolution. The constitutionalists, on the other hand, controlled the cities and had more access to wealth. So, we will see that the Mexican Constitution of 1917 will attempt to change the social problems of Mexico. It will include land reform, right? That's one of the things that Zapata um, Villa wanted. It will include public education, universal suffrage, and a one-term president. It will include many of the social reforms that the peasants wanted, but were too expensive to implement right away. But the symbolic symbolism of this gesture that, hey, we see that you want these things, we're going to try and make them happen, is really valuable. So one of the things that they promise is a one-term president and that all classes are equal before the law. So Alvaro Obregón is going to be elected president and the Civil War will end. In the end, the Mexican Civil War killed two million And Mexico itself was pretty destroyed. So in the 1920s and 30s, we will see that the party of the institutionalized revolution will develop. The next president will be Cardenas, and he will implement reforms promised in the Constitution. He will lessen the power of the military, seize control of foreign-owned companies, especially oil companies, So this will mean that wealthy people no longer monopolize everything. And the Catholic Church will no longer control all education. It's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. So PBS had a really good 
short documentary on Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. I'd recommend you watch it. It's called The Storm That Swept Mexico. So, what factors led to the Mexican Revolution of 1910? What resulted from it? Okay, quickly, let's talk about South America. Argentina, and then we'll talk a little bit about Brazil. So, in Argentina, you have a territory known as Las Pampas. This is flat, fertile land that's really easy to till. So, we are going to see that with this land available, we're going to have a massive growth of the cattle industry in Argentina. The pampas will be divided, plowed, cultivated, fenced. And Argentina's economy is going to be really reliant on exporting wheat and meat to Europe. The government will really be dominated by wealthy landowners. They will let foreign companies build infrastructure and industry. So again, these things won't be state-owned or locally owned, but foreign-owned, which means mm, control and wealth is leaving the country and going to foreign companies, which isn't great for the long run. These wealthy landowners will spend lavishly. Argentina will have its capital in Buenos Aires, which will become known as the Paris of South America. And I've been there. Yeah, it does kind of look like Paris. They very purposely designed their cities, their city to look like Paris. They are going to import basically all their manufactured goods, so they're not really having any industry locally. So both Argentina and Brazil will see a lot of exporting of agricultural products like coffee, Mex um, cocoa, rubber. The wealthy in Brazil will live like the wealthy in Argentina. Both will have a small but outspoken middle class and lots and lots of very, very desperately poor people. In Argentina, the poor will be Spanish and Italian landless immigrants. Remember, Argentina slaughtered most of their indigenous population. In Brazil, the poor will be sharecroppers and the descendants of slaves. So you do see lots of agricultural trade and prosperity. So when the Great Depression hits, we see that all exports will really stop, the economy implodes, and your political system is destabilized. And many of these Latin American leaders will look at what's happening in Europe, specifically the rise of fascist rulers in Europe, and think, hey, that looks pretty good. We want more government control of the economy, but we don't want communism. So Getulio Vargas will be the dictator of Brazil for 24 years, and he will create what's known as the Estado Novo, the new state. So he will rewrite the constitution and turn um, Brazil into a fascist state. So his dictatorship will really emphasize industrialization and helping the urban poor, but not the poor peasants, right? He will raise import duties and promote national firms. This does increase industrial um, growth, and it will really become a model for other Latin American countries. So to other Latin American countries, hey, fascism works. And yet, we see that there are massive environmental impacts. Mining increases. You have the cities growing, the creation of favelas in like Rio and um, Sao Paulo. Scrubland is turned into farmland. You see deforestation. And there's no real help for the poor peasants. In Argentina, they're hurting from the Great Depression as well. So in 1930, a general will overthrow the president and rule um, as a military dictator for 13 years. And then you will have Juan Perón lead a military revolt in 1943. He is going to rule at two different points in Argentina's history. 
And he is a charismatic ruler. His wife is Eva Durate Peron. You might be familiar with the musical Evita. It's based on her life. She is really a gifted speaker and a popular political leader, right? Juan Perón wouldn't have been nearly as successful if it wasn't for Evita. She campaigned to help the urban poor by founding schools and hospitals. She was really beloved. Um, Juan Perón will really create a populist dictatorship. He will spend oodles of money on industry, on well, social welfare and the military, and basically spends all of Argentina's money. He's going to be unable to create a stable government. And once Evita dies, she um, was very clearly the one that everyone liked, and his government will be overthrown. So, again, he helps the urban poor, but poor peasants, not so much. So, Latin America after World War II. For Latin America, World War II is not a critical event. Latin America is moderately involved. They help with some, like, supplying. But it is going to see a surge of radical socialist unrest, particularly in Bolivia, um, Guatemala, and Cuba in the 1950s and onward. So we'll talk about that. But for now, I want you to explain various reactions to existing power structures in the period after 1900 in Latin America or India. And I want you to be able to compare and contrast what is happening in Latin America with what's going on in Europe, Asia, or Africa between 1930 and 1970. Okay. Thank you for listening. Um, well, we just have about a few more, maybe four more lectures to do for unit eight and then we'll just do one for unit nine in general and remember there are other resources available for you on our unit eight slash nine youtube playlist and if you have any questions please don't hesitate to ask thanks for listening